I would like to first thank tonight's co-presenters for the program, which you just hopefully saw, uh, Velocity Dance Center and Gay City. Tonight we had a special um, treat of dance short films, and we have with us some of the artists from those pieces. And I'd like to welcome Alex Crozier, who's the choreographer, writer, director, executive producer for the Millennial Experience. Ooh, say hello. hello say, there you go. Um, hey, hey. Stefan Borgong, Lucian Postaway from A Headlamp or Two. Bye. Um, Bruno Roque, who is the director, helped to direct Headlamp or Two and was a choreographer for other works in this series. He's here for the choreographer, Bet Tetweiler, tonight. Terwilliger. Terwilliger, there we go. And Henry Wirtz, who's a videographer extraordinaire. And Henry, I think you did all of them in the series, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, all of them. Filming dance, so I mean, Marcy did such a great job in the making of interviews. So I'll try and keep keep something fresh about learning something new. Um, I think the making of was almost as beautiful as the actual piece. But I'm kind of curious, Stefan and Lucien, what inspired the makeup and the hair and the costumes? And did you guys do that? Was that Beth's idea? That was all Beth. Really? Um, yeah. <laughs> she said, like, uh, she's like, well, I want to put you in lashes and lipstick. And we were like, all right, we're, we're here for it. Um, she she wanted to, I think, is it, always looking to challenge, like, gender roles. Um, and so that was that was a way of doing doing that for her. That's what I liked about it. When I first saw it, I, I didn't, because I was just watching it on my laptop, and I had to squint, like, is Lucian wearing eyelashes? <laughs> Um, do you know what came first, the music, Moonlight Sonata, or the decision to film it at night? Because that was, was a few, I think it was the music that came first. That was uh, a beautiful, beautiful idea. Yeah. Um, I think Beth really wanted to take something that was familiar um, to a lot of people and sort of create around it in a way that makes it new and fresh. And, um, from the making of video, I learned that actually Henry was the one that suggested to um, do the filming at night. Right, right. Good job. Was, Good job. Interested, sorry, um, interested in like taking something that was familiar because this was now we're kind of pre the beginning of pan. I mean, we're post pandemic, but like when that started, she was like, "We are all experiencing something that we're like really unclear. We're not sure what's happening," um, and so she wanted to have give that familiarity with the music. Um, but oh. then with the filming where it's like, it looks like you're on a different planet in a way. You can't really recognize what's happening, where you are. Um, yeah, in fact, if it weren't for the making of, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't know what the setting was. Yeah. Yeah, so so Henry, you're used to filming stories through dance. I'm kind of curious, is there anything you had to convince Beth to do differently than the way she envisioned it because of the way that you thought that would look on film? Like, that's not gonna work. Um, no, not so much convincing her otherwise. I mean, this was such a fun project, specifically this one, because the ideas that Beth wanted to execute, like how she saw it visually, um, were, was such a, like a really interesting challenge for myself. So it was, it was really, you know, she had such a clear idea, you know, what you saw on the screen there was, was, you know, to, you know, the 95th percent, like exactly what she was telling me in her head. And so when she was telling me those things, I was like, okay, how can we actually execute that with the cameras and stuff like that? Um, so it was, it worked out so well for me because it's, you know, it's always the best mix when the director, the person with the vision and the person with the camera have the same ideas and are, you know, going for the, the same goal. Cool. So Alex, kind of the same question for you, more one of, as a director, what's different about filming dance and dancing in front of a live audience? Like what's the pros and cons of filming dance? I mean, yeah, you get to edit it, but. Well, I think that, I mean, the, the two worlds have a, they, they have a lot of similarity, you know, in the sense of like, as long as you uh, can kind of, you know, as a, as a dancer, if you're able to kind of like recreate movement over and over and over again, um, with some consistency, then, and you can do that in the studio, you can do that on film. Um, so that's really, a, you know, a great way of, of kind of like, um, that's, that's already great. You have that in your toolbox. For me, as, as a director, it was kind of seeing all the ways that it could be expanded. Um, 
from adapt from looking at it from the stage and then saying, well, then how can I with my team? Because I it wasn't just me. I, I had um, my videographer Egan Cobb and then my two creative uh, conceptive producers, Paul Flanagan and, and Blair Jolly Elliott. They really helped me as well to kind of say, okay, well, this is how it looked on stage. How could it look on film? Um, and then when okay. you're filming, it's just uh, you know, as I'm sure everyone uh, here can kind of attest to, it's like just many hours of of repeating and and uh, you know a, a wonderful creativity thing where you can try new things in the moment. And as long as you have it all on film, you get to pick and choose later in the editing room. So yeah, I love all of those things. Cool. Having watched the Millennial Experience and a headlamp or two, and then watching PNB's presentation last night, very, very different experiences, just completely different. Um, I mean, the upside is everybody has a great seat, right? But the whole camera as part of the actors really works for me. It'd be awesome to have a camera on stage at PNB. It's like, you know, I was an extra once in Swan Lake and it was really fun to be in the middle and see dance from that angle and it would ruin the ballet, right? Because you could see the cameras. But I, I like the, the being able to pick your point of view when you're live audience. I could pick who to watch and when it's filmed, they do it for you. So they it better be a good, you know, good choice because you only get to see their point of view. And I just wondered if you have to think about that when you're when you're filming, like, oh, we don't want to miss the big picture here. You have to kind of balance focusing on one individual as opposed to the group, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think a lot of that is, there's, for, for my experience with the Millennial Experience, there was a wonderful amount of um, collaboration. So we planned for many, many months in pre-production. We rehearsed for a full month. Okay. Um, with, the, with the cast, with the dancers, and then also with Egan. Um, we kind of rehearsed some pre-choreographed moves. So by the time we got onto set, or whichever sets, because we filmed all over Seattle, we had a good understanding and it was very easy to say, okay, great. Now Egan has a, a fantastic idea of like how to take things forward. And so a lot of times um, he would then be able to facilitate um, how the scene could, you know, take place based off of tons of prior conversation. Um, and then in the editing process there, we all had the raw footage shared between hard drives um, and the scenes would be edited. He would kind of, even would make an initial edit and then um, I would look at them, Paul would look at them, Blair would look at them. Um, and we would just kind of say, okay, well, does anything need to be added, taken away? um tweaked slightly um so that that was that was kind of our experience with that at least yeah bruno i know you were heavily involved in editing too do you have anything to add to that what, what do you think about when you're editing various I mean, my pro mm, I mean the process is different for uh my editing because basically i just gather all the footage uh captured during the process and try and create a narrative and tell that story. I, I really didn't add any uh, hand in how that two footage was captured. I mean, there, was in, there were instructions and requests, but it was all whatever I can take and then make the most of it. And then things kind of grew from there. Initially, uh, the documentary was just supposed to be a little making up of 10, 15 minutes and it did, ended up just you know becoming a different beast and putting a lot of hours into the editing so it, it was a completely different process as what henry uh you know and, and and alex did um and but it was it was such a learning experience so but i yeah it was good i, I know it's good for me henry were there times when you said oh no you're gonna want to film from this angle um Funnily enough, not not on this project. No, I mean, because, you know, when we're when you're watching the piece, everything looks like either one shot pause zooming all the way in or one shot zooming all the way out. Um, in, and I was, some, I was, yeah, in some ways, I like the film almost as much as being able to see it in real person because you're able to do things like superimpose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Instead of having dancers 
over here and, and having to, they were superimposed over each other. So it told a little bit of a different story than I think I would have gotten live. Yeah, yeah. And that was, you know, that was something that Beth wanted from the very start was to kind of stay away from harder cuts and to, and to really, you know, impress upon the audience that, you know, that duality of what you were seeing there, yeah. right? And those opposites and the light. I and didn't even and recognize, everything. I didn't even realize one was wearing white and the other was wearing black till I watched it for like the third time. You know, yeah, like, yeah. Was, there are parts, you know, just kind of, it kind of pulls yeah. you right in and, and you, you almost lose focus at certain parts, but you're right in there. Stefan and Lucien, do you think it was more intimate or less intimate working this way? I mean, you guys are basically in Beth's living room and her and yours, but you weren't physically touching. I mean, we were definitely bumping into each other <laughs> when we were doing like the making of um, and learning the choreography and everything. Yeah. Um, so in a way, actually, when we finally got to filming, uh, it was really, it was strange not to have each other yeah. close by. Um, suddenly I was just by myself in the middle of this giant right. bowl. And um, so, yeah, I think the first few times when we had tried it separately, it actually became more of a challenge and we kind of missed the, like being able to just check each other quickly if we needed a little sign of what the next step was or you know, the comfort of bumping in and like right. having a goal. We're, yeah, we read each other or feel each other's energy um, too. And it's such, such a different process doing dance for film because often dance is just a one-time gig. You, you do it once and that's what you do to the public and they, um, they take it and like being a dancer who is being filmed it's a different headspace and a different brain where like you know there are gonna be multiple takes and then so you want to give something a little bit different in the next take right. fast for or you can maybe do it better do or focus more on one thing so it's um that was a shift for me once we actually got to the filming part it threw me a little bit that like a i didn't have this guy next to me and b i was like very aware of, of what was happening would you do it again happily with a smile or would it be like, oh, I just want to do it in the studio? No, I love it. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I and think it, yeah. editing is wonderful. <laughs> when done well. <laughs> when done well. <laughs> okay. I have a question for you. I'm, I'm glad Beth's not here, actually. Um, was the was the choreography as you're learning it, was it telling you a story? Did you understand it or were you just mimicking the movement? We, um, the way that Beth actually started working with us was she just gave us um, like three simple gestures and asked us to sort of create a little phrase using those gestures. Okay. Um, so immediately from the beginning, it became a personal experience for both of us and um, it was interesting to sort of work separately, each on our phrase, and then um, at one point we sort of brought them together, and that was that was the beginning of the, the creation of the movement. So the first part of the choreography actually is reflecting um, something that I sort of created. The second part moves into something that Lucian created, and then in all of that, Beth kind of sprinkled her like talented fairy dust all over us and sort of made it her own. So um, yeah, it was a really wonderfully collaborative experience. And I think working that way was really beneficial, especially because in the moments when we were um, only working over Zoom, uh, there was already something sort of personal for us in our bodies um, that Beth could sort of translate so is that Beth's normal process or was that because of the way that you were having to do it over Zoom, the collaboration? I, I think she she spoke from the beginning that she likes to give an idea and then have a dancer interpret that. And then she uses her eye to say like, great, I love that. What if we do this a little bit more? Or um, okay. if you take that moment and expand it. Um, yeah. And that's, because she was very clear that she wanted everything to feel very personal. She didn't want us acting. She didn't want us performing. Um, she wanted us just to be ourselves. Um, so the movement had to reflect that also. Now, are you in a side split right now? <laughs> <laughs> always. I'm always in a side split. 
<laughs> I thank you for that footage and uh, <laughs> being able to put it in because it was a good moment. <laughs> Alex, one of my favorite quotes. I love the quotes in the beginning of the film, but the millennials have ruined everything. You know, just all the funny stereotypical things about millennials and then, and then kind of unraveling all that. And I thought that was very, very um, clever. And I like the just juxtaposition of, maybe you could talk about a little bit the juxtaposing the millennial stereotypes against masculine versus feminine stereotypes and talking about them like in the same breath. Yeah, we really were, we were very interested in um, having different conversations that ran concurrently throughout the film. Um, and so that was, that was, that was one of the, the kind of the sub conversations that, um, I believe it was Egan who found a lot of that that footage that we used. Um, anything that wasn't um, an actual interview that we filmed, um, those extra sound bites. I think they they um, Egan found all of those, um, and they served as really great um, kinds of like addition, like additional bits of information that um, yeah, and served to give us kind of like anchor points right at the beginning where we can kind of give you like a, a kind of snapshotty idea of um, how you have heard about millennials being portrayed in the media. And then through the next 50 minutes, really breaking that down um, to kind of giving quite, um, to just giving you as much experience, as much lived experience as possible of as many different types of people as possible so that you begin to see people as human. And of course, um, for anyone who has seen the film, and even if you haven't, um, it does not just focus on millennials because the entire goal um, was to make sure that the film felt like a conversation that um, was happening nationally. Um, and, and that there is no, um, there's no one generation that saves everything. Um, there's there's sound bites in the film that are there to kind of inspire millennials um, with with that kind of with that kind of talk. But the reason for why there's everyone from uh, millennials to baby boomers is because it um, it is the whole film is is a conversation around social issues um, that absolutely affect everyone. Yeah, I like the idea of millennials as the nonconformists, just like, you know, nonconforming gender roles. It's just another way of we're not all the same, but here's what we bring to the table that that is really for the first time ever. This whole like, we're not going to wait for change. We're going to make it happen. I thought that was really a, a, an interesting uh, take home. Um, the whole appropriation versus appreciation with culture is really a fine line and kind of a gray area because I totally got the part where Vicky was talking about how the African dancer was teaching dance to these school teachers and the school teachers wanted to know, how am I gonna teach this to my kids? And the African teacher said, you're not, it's, you know, it's not yours to teach. I thought that was really interesting because where's that line of universality? So like, couldn't we say, well, ballet is really a Russian art form or a French art form and who are we to teach it to American kids? I mean, where, when does it become Shakespeare and it's just universal and where is it, belong to a culture where's that line and that's that's an interesting theme i think well that line is a hundred percent drawn in the sand clear as day because if you come from a culture of any kind of western background you don't have to be white but if you're coming from a place of power if you're coming from a hemisphere of let's say that has a lot of wealth then it's quite clear that if you look over to another uh, person's culture um, where so much has been taken from them, so much has been erased over time, it's then quite clear what is appropriation, what is appreciation. Um, that moment, I believe that you're referring to in the film, um, Vicki Watts, who, um, she used to run uh, the dance department at, at Cornish for I liked her a lot um, and did amazing. Uh, so she is actually referring to um, an, an Aboriginal dancer um, 
uh, who, who ran a company in Australia. And um, in that moment uh, that she's referring to in the soundbite, so that is, that's absolutely a moment of many people of um, places of power, of places of access, um, of places of privilege around the world have come to learn from a, uh, a person who comes from a community that has been marginalized. And in that moment, there is cultural appreciation happening, let's say, if they're all learning right. uh, movement. But it is true that the bearer of the cultural knowledge, which is a direct quote from, from Vicky in the film, it's the bearer of the cultural knowledge then can give that on. But it is, um, it is a very dangerous thing that if you have uh, places that were once quite Eurocentric in mindset like Shakespeare, the moment that you begin to tell other people that are, um, that have been marginalized, where their cultures have been already taken from, where they are trying to fit themselves into um, the a kind of dominant Western um, view and Western culture of the world, the moment that you begin um, from those higher places to say you can't teach Shakespeare unless you have um, you know British heritage, right? You can't do your uh, you know. Uh, master's degree in in French fairy tales, unless you actually have you know direct ancestry to France, um, you you're just creating even more systems of oppression that already exist. That's the thing. The film is not uh, doing some great thing to anyone by by saying here's cultural appropriation and here's appreciation. It's just highlighting what already exists. And I think so often, so many people overlook um, really, um, they're very visible moments, but they just, they overlook really small details of life of when they might not be respecting a person's culture. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And it really, that discussion really opened my eyes to be cognizant of that. The, Cause yeah. we all want to appreciate but we don't want to offend. Well, yeah, people get way too stuck on not wanting to offend. People get way too stuck on not wanting to be wrong. You're gonna be wrong. You're gonna offend someone. That's that's actually, I think, the one takeaway that everyone of every uh, every aspect of life can take from. At some point, you're going to be wrong. And at some point, you're going to offend someone whether you've been working really hard on your impact versus your intent, it's going to happen because people have so many differences of opinion. They have different faiths. They have different walks of life. But the best thing to do is to be able to remain accountable and acknowledge where you might have gone wrong, honor what that lived experience is of someone else, and then try to move forward um, as positively as possible and the film seeks to educate people enough so that they do feel comfortable to engage in conversation with people. Um, and so that hopefully if they are, you know, if it's, if they do discover that maybe they're wrong about something or that they've offended someone, that they can take some steps to reflect, you know, and, and move forward. What about the millennial experience, your words, informed the movement, the dance, like what about the move, the dance portions of the film were particularly millennial? Like why is dance a good art form to express millennialism? Well, that question is, um, okay, so that, that I, so the millennial experience is, is the title of, as the, is the title of the film. It's a way of describing, um, a very, very broad sector of life by millions and millions of people. Um, it's the largest generation. Yeah, quite a large generation. But the way that I decided to go about with the movement, the movement that you're watching is my, you know, that's my own kind of innate movement vocabulary. Okay. Um, 
and that just comes from that just comes from my background um, of just training and and having varied interests um, and kind of moving in and out of various dance idioms throughout all of my life. Um, so there isn't um, there is no millennial movement, but um, you are watching me. You are watching my movement language come through. Um, you are watching my um, my view of storytelling come through. You are then also watching the dancers with their own interpretation of that, because that's a big, I'm very big upon that. I, I say, here is the movement and here is how you initiate it, but you have to do it in the way that is comfortable for you. And that way it looks like everyone just kind of like started doing this movement at home. So it, it has a kind of like, fresh, spontaneous feel. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how, that's why the movement in the, in the film looks the way that it does. Um, so there's nothing in particular that you want us to know about millennials from this film? Uh, nothing in particular that I want people to know about millennials in this right, film? Right, like the, you're saying that the reason that you made the film isn't because this you want us to understand millennials, that's not, it's not, entirely just about millennials it's not entirely just about millennials because um so it's not about looking at that title and it's not about looking at um one aspect of the film so concretely that um you're not able to see that there are multiple layers that run throughout the film concurrently. So it's the fact that it's it's like, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like, um, it's, 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 it's just a way of setting you up to talk about social issues. I've created something where at face value, it looks like we're only gonna talk about one thing, one generation. When in fact you go on a journey of hearing from lived experiences of not just millennials about these social issues, um, and that, it, so that's that's why the film looks the way that it does. But if you begin to only look at one aspect, you miss the ten other uh, plot subpoints. Mm -hmm. that are a part of the film that are integral to it. Um, and then you miss the whole purpose. It's not about taking that title at face value. It's not, it's about saying there's a wealth of information that I was not privy to before I watched this film. Okay, thank you. Lucy and Stefan, yeah. what do you think A Headlamp or Two is about? What if you had to pick one word? Pressure, pressure. <laughs> um, yeah. I would say tension. Tension. <laughs> tension, okay. Yeah, um, I think we were all definitely processing a lot of tension at the time. Um, it was also when uh, I think a lot of people were being confronted with all the social injustices that we have in this country, along with the whole all COVID. Um, so there was a lot of tension that nationally, globally was being experienced. Um, we we initially thought that we were gonna be dancing together, um, being a couple, but there was also that tension of, she wanted to layer, like these are two people that are together, but they're not together. Right. Um, and that going back and forth um, between us, that kind of murky lighting, the, um, yeah, tension. <laughs> How was that working together? Do you like that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> and let me ask you and Alex um, both, do you think COVID has changed dance forever? Do you think it opened the door to like, hey, the choreographer doesn't have to be on site. We can do these rehearsals on Zoom. Or do you think that this is just a temporary setup until we go back to normal? Y'all wanna answer that? <laughs> First, I, I hope that we make some, some changes in, in the dance community because I think that there's a lot that can evolve um, 
to, to bring different audiences in. Um, and I think as a choreographer, like I've never been interested in choreography um, myself because I felt like it's such a big, um, big open thing. But using video um, as a way to focus the audience's eye is I think a really powerful tool um, and something that's so interesting. Um, so I, I, I hope to see more dance that's created with that lens. Um, that you get to really see the choreographer, not as just creating a tableau, but as like zooming your eye in on something. Nice. Alex, what do you think? Well, I certainly, you know, I hope that the pandemic coupled with the Black Lives Matter movement did allow people within the arts to begin to reflect on the way that art is created um, and the way that people within the arts are treated. Um, you know, and to kind of piggyback off of, off of like film in general, kind of what Lucy and was saying. Yeah, I think it's, I think film was a wonderful, wonderful medium that like, you know, truth be told, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm just kind of diving into, you know, um, and I'm really excited to kind of see where that goes. And I do think that, um, what's wonderful about let's say you know being kind of stuck at home um as very scary as that was i think for many many people and still is for many people um i i think the kind of way that it forced at least if i spoke for myself from this point of view of like of how it forced me to change direction and how i um navigated my own artistic vision um, you know, and, and for the better, I would say, I hope that through some of a lot of that pain, um, from both experiencing the first wave of the pandemic, but also with, um, hopefully what many people were doing was self-reflecting during the Black Lives Matter movement, which is, is still going, I would say, um, I hope that there are some changes for the better that happen within the arts. Okay. Bruno, I've watched your choreography adapt quite adeptly from being a stage piece to a film piece. It was just like, oh, now we're writing for a different, I mean, it seemed like you just turned on a dime. Did it feel like that yeah. to you or did it feel like you were adapting things? Uh, yeah, I, sh it, I mean, a bit of both, but it did turn on a dime, uh, and I actually enjoy that. I enjoy to uh, adapt whatever circumstance I have, and I like to uh, mold myself to, to to what's happening. So, in, in I mean, I, I didn't choreograph the, this this right. specific project, but in, in part of I did choreograph something else, part of the of the continuum program for Seattle Dance Collective. And that's that's what I'm referring to. Yeah, um, and um, I mean. I, I to be and and you were talking in, uh, now if 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 it has changed dance and I I don't feel like it has changed dance fundamentally yet anyway it changed the way we perceive it and it changed the way uh, we we look at it and we think about it and I think that eventually will change hmm. uh, the actual art form but I, I don't think we're there yet um, uh, talking about fundamentally changing changing dance right and hmm. and I really felt that during the process where my process was pretty much the same. Okay, we had to conceptualize it uh, to to be seen in, in in a different way, but but the way I approach the actual creating of, of the piece, I mean, truth be told, it's, it's a relatively short piece, but everything, all the the fundamentals were there, were the same. So uh, it was surprisingly um, uh, familiar in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, the medium was completely different. Yeah. And Henry, what do you think? All dance will be on film in the future. Oh um, no, probably not all dance, but you know, it, it's kind of like it, like any of these medium shifts in art. A lot of times, um, you know, the the caterpillar and the cocoon kind of stay, right? Like, I think we're gonna have a lot of live dance, um, but I think this kind of opens up, you know, the door a little bit in a different direction because, you know, working with dance and cameras and stuff, it's like it you like you all have been saying you immediately you know, start to realize you can put the camera wherever you want and that's where the audience is going to be. So that's a whole different, 
different area that you're getting into. So they they are so similar in so many ways and how they're presented, but they I think will be developing um, separately but together. You know, I think they're going to be going in their separate little paths, but interchanged. Alex, what are you working on next? Well, um, in the immediacy of the film, uh, I'm looking to get some streaming deals for it. Cool. Um, and so, which is very exciting. I'm very, very happy about that. Um, nothing 100% concrete yet, but that's that's my end goal for it. Um, and then I, I am continuing to kind of brainstorm new ideas about doing live performance um, when it becomes safer um, and, and kind of merging the knowledge that I have so far of film, merging what I've already created, which is um, just kind of um, an aesthetic, um, like a choreographic aesthetic and the way that I tell story. Um, and merging my kind of affinity of, of pop concerts and to kind of make all of that fit together, um, which um, is a challenge and I, I love an artistic challenge. So that's, um, that's my next goal um, and to kind of talk more from a, from a perspective that I know I can uh, share from 100%, which is like, what it is to be like a BIPOC gay male in this time period. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I have brainstorming currently. Well, beautiful movement. I can't wait to see more. Thanks. Stefan, are we going to lure you back to dance? Um, yeah, I have to say it. It was really nice to revisit dance. And it was actually really nice to revisit it during a pandemic, during something that was just so crazy and odd and every moment was something new um and somehow with that dance project i was able to kind of go back to a place of something that's really familiar to me and actually was very comforting so um yeah i'm looking forward to like you know throwing on that blanket every so often just to kind of right on enjoy that kindness. I would like to thank you all for your art and your candor. The world needs more art right now, and I, I just can't thank you enough. Do any of you have questions for each other? I would just say congratulations, I, Alex. Yeah. It's really, really a great film, um, a lot of fun to watch. I love the animation layering over. Um, that was really, really cool. It was very oh. cool. It's almost like its own genre. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That um, I, I loved y'all's work. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like all of, I, I, I really, really loved it. Um, and that animation that is done by our um, graphic designer, Terry Hahn, who um, I have never met him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> He's wow. in Singapore. Wow. Um, and, uh, and so all of that, it's some of that is Terry's work and some of that is also Egan's work. So Egan, uh, it, it really speaks to how multifaceted he is because he he edited the basis of every single scene and provided some animation as well, um, including the title graphics. And then Terry also yeah. um, did a large basis. So um, it is really thanks to them in terms of that uh, that animation stuff. So, yeah. right. cool. Thank you, everyone, for your time. That's a wrap. I really appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Th